Oh, now, now we, now, now we're getting like the. Well, we'll see as it goes, but this is like totally different scene. Just looking at the key on the keychain, the key was labeled Hen House, but the lock Eureka was trying to open didn't belong to that door. It should have opened effortlessly. At least that's what was supposed to happen, but it didn't open. I noticed beads of sweat forming on Eureka's forehead. She was the one who came up with this idea. Eureka was starting to panic. The rest of us started to panic too. Sony opens the hen house. Let's start. Let's go back. Shh. We were supposed to be cleaning out the hen house. They found us back here. They found us. Found out why we were here and why we were trying to open up the lock to the back door. Then all four of us were sure to be sentenced to splaying pain. Well, oh, panic, Rico. That key opens the lock. This lock, right? Right, try the right. We shut up for a minute. It's just the right key. It's just hard to open. That's all. She was almost shrieking. Our hearts were pounding loudly. It was as though the sounds of our heartbeats was echoing throughout the hall. And at that point, we heard footsteps that didn't belong to a child. Shh! Somebody's coming. The three of us held our breath, but Enrico didn't hear it. She kept fussing with the lock and the key, as if everything would be okay if she just opened the lock. Because somebody's coming to be quiet! I know it says the right key. Not three, and I already tried it and opened it. Come on, why isn't this working? This lock is open, we can be happy, and we can say goodbye to this hell. Enrico, someone's coming! It's the title card, Hikaresu and the Grey Guy. My father and mother died. Well, that's depressing. And sudden there, isn't it? Don't know exactly how old they were. I mean, this intro is bizarre when you think about it. We start out, okay. Some girl talking to her grandfather. I mean, I say some girl, it's pretty obvious who she is, obviously. If you've been paying attention to the briefs arc. And then it's like, okay. Then it's a flashback to uh, some hellish kind of scenario and then it's like oh and then suddenly a flashback to a like not to spoil it too much but that flashback takes place after this flashback if that makes any sense but they both take place before the opening you know bit where she's talking to her grandfather I don't know exactly how old they were I was too young to remember they went shopping at me, and that must be why they were punished. What? It was a train accident. What a terrible disaster. A lot of people died in that instant. But maybe my father was one of the lucky ones. He was still alive when he arrived at the hospital, so he was able to share his final words with me. My mother died instantly. I didn't want to admit that this person I could hardly recognize was my father. As I called out to him, I hoped that it was someone else instead. You know, you may know that it's like, you didn't voice act that bit, it's just like, yeah, just... Just imagine it being voice acted, rather than me kind of ruining the mood. Well, I'm already ruining the mood anyway, but you get the idea. But, unfortunately, it was my father. Maybe I shouldn't have woken him. Because when I woke him up, he was reminded of the miserable agony that he had forgotten. He tried to move his right arm, so he could bat my head. But his arm was wrapped in bandages, and his hand was no longer there. I couldn't find his hand anywhere on the bed. I only had scary memories of his right hand. His main job was to slap me when I did something bad. But I never wished it to be gone. Besides, that hand also patted my head. Even though that only happened a few times, it was a big warm hand and it struck my head very gently. No matter what good deeds I did, he could no longer rub my head. No, his hand was the least of his worries. He had to go into emergency surgery. The doctors already warned me that the chance of him surviving was very low. That is why I was allowed to see him, regardless of his condition. Not only could he no longer rub my head, he might be gone forever. Daddy, this surgery will make you better, right? Daddy, you'll get better, right? Right? <coughs> Listen carefully. 
and that he might not make it. Even if I die, you have to be strong, okay? Oh no, you'll get better. The doctor's going to make you better. So you're not going to die. He was a stubborn and old-fashioned father. He believed endurance was a virtue, and he never complained about anything. That is why I couldn't believe he actually said he might not make it. I tried desperately to deny his words. But even that wish wouldn't prolong his life. My father, knowing his time was limited, tried to tell me some important things. I interpreted his efforts by crying like a baby. Interrupted. I just wanted him to slap me. Just like he used to do every time I cried like a baby. Well, that's, that's a bit of an odd thing to want. But he would never slap me again. Listen, well... Well, and I both lost all of our family in the war. So, after I'm dead, there won't be anyone left to take care of you. He didn't need to tell me that. My parents used to tell me that all the time, so I was aware of that fact. In other words, my father was the only relative I had left in this entire world. How did the... how'd that happen? Did they die fighting in the war? Or... You know... Were they, you know, civilian casualties of the war? If... if I die, you can count on Dr. Takano. Dr. Hifumi Takano. Can you say it? Hifumi Takano. That's right. Dr. Hifumi Takano. He's my former teacher. He will help you. <laughs> Many doctors came into the room in a hurry. He wanted to tell me something else, but the doctors stopped him from talking so I wasn't able to hear him. I was kicked out of the room. I didn't know what to do. Nobody told me how my father was doing or when the surgery was going to start. And nobody told me. That was going to be the last conversation I ever had with my father. I think I asked people at the government office about Dr. Takano. They asked me if I knew his phone number. I said I didn't. Well, yeah, that's just freaking wonderful, isn't it? It's like, it's all uh, the name, but not any contact details. I mean, kind of would be difficult to do in that situation. Then they didn't ask me anything further. Sometimes they told me they'd look into it, but nothing led to anything. They couldn't find me a guardian, so I ended up going to an orphanage. And as we all know, orphanages always suck ass. You know, it's like, you know, in fiction, orphanages are always hellholes. Then you look at orphanages in real life and you hear the history of them, and it's like, well, it's kind of because they're based on real hellhole orphanages. It's like, for fuck's sake, why? At the time, there were plenty of orphans around the war, so although there were many orphanages around, they were all full. There were also some orphanages run by civilians. I was sent to one of those civilian orphanages. You know, I always find that orphanages are always run by people who hate kids, and always just like, why the hell did they even open it in the first place? There was no profit to be had in taking in an orphan in the first place. So I thought those civilians who were running off new duties must be, have been very good people. I was sure they hoped that their children would grow in this loving environment and enter into society with a sense of gratitude. But reality isn't so kind. How many children as well can actually express their gratitude towards their parents in the first place? Children are supposed to be nurtured by their parents' love. Therefore, when that environment is destroyed, their hearts are wounded. Every child has his or her own personality. See, perfection doesn't guarantee that a child will become someone uh, angelic. Not everyone's heart can be healed. That is why there were some problem kids at the orphanage. Maybe I shouldn't call them problem kids, though. Sadness and despair of losing their parents, and the anger at having to hide such feelings fill these kids' hearts. Spending time individually with the children could have solved their problems. But at the orphanage where I was, none of the staff members even tried to spend time with them or put in an effort to understand them. All they could do was make sure that the kids followed the rules. Therefore, they could only see the children's emotional pleas for help as problems. You know, it's one thing if it's like an understaffed orphanage where like 
the staff are doing the best they can. That's one thing. But not even trying at all, that's, that's terrible. In this world, nobody expresses love without expecting something in return. The person who founded that orphanage was expecting something in return as well. He wanted the children to appreciate him. That is why such a faint dream was destroyed by cruel reality. Children call for all the orphanage of prison and nobody appreciated the staff at all. In fact, all they did was complain. That made the staff slowly realize that love alone can run a facility like that. So like how the children call it a prison. The staff started to recognize the facility as a prison too. There was a chain reaction resulting from mistrust on both sides. The staff bound the children with rules so they could suppress problem behavior. There was a framed picture of the founder of this orphanage, but I had never seen him in person. Was he satisfied with the fact he put his own money into this social service? Or maybe he finally realized his dream of being surrounded by angelic children and being celebrated for what he did was simply that. A dream. I don't know. But there's one thing I'm certain of. He was an asshole. Such a dream didn't exist at the orphanage. There were so many rules and several plausible standards outlined for us. But the most valued one was silence. Children's chatter tends to increase each other's volume, just like mics drawing closer. Sometimes that leads to fights and a disturbance of order. So children are forbidden from speaking with each other. With those disallowed, they must have thought things would go smoothly. However, I think I always heard people's voices at the orphanage. There were two kinds of voices. One was the staff yelling, and the other was the children crying. We were not allowed to walk around inside the orphanage freely, so we never knew who it was that was crying. One time, along with a crying and yelling, we heard the noises of metallic things being smashed against each other. We knew it was some kind of punishment, but there was a way for us, well, no way for us to even imagine what it was. We trembled, pretended we didn't hear anything, and kept working on our silence. One of my roommates told me it was the casket punishment. But she didn't tell me any further, and I didn't want to know either. But even if we behaved exactly the same way as yesterday, if the staff were in a bad mood, they might pick on us. So even if I didn't want to know, I might suddenly find out what the casket punishment is one day. Footsteps of a staff member were getting closer. We noticed them, so we straightened our backs and pretended we were studying hard. It was more important than the staff saw us doing so than us actually getting any work done. Noticed the girl next to me was falling asleep, so I poked her with my elbow. She noticed my signal and straightened her back like the other children. It was almost evening. This was the hardest time for us to keep ourselves awake, and the most dangerous time. The door to our room opened, and a mean-looking man showed up. Then he looked around to make sure none of us were falling asleep. Even if we were actually studying hard, if we thought we were asleep, we were out. That was why we had to make sure we appeared to be studying very hard. The man walked around our desks. I hoped he would just walk by me. That was what we all prayed as we kept working on our homework. The more we pretended to study hard, the more we could hear the sound of metal objects. The sound of metal objects crashing into each other along with screams. We couldn't even imagine what the poor subject of that punishment was going through. Maybe there was something even worse than the casket punishment. To raise such fears, we tried to concentrate even harder on our work. We kept working. As the metal sounds and the screams went on forever. Fucked up, man. The only time we were allowed to exchange words with our roommates was right after turning the lights off to go to bed. Being located in the middle of the mountains, the orphanage was very quiet at night. To make sure the staff members were far enough from our room, we enjoyed talking amongst ourselves. That was the only leisure time allowed to us. But it wasn't anything nice like enjoying pleasant conversation. Why? Because we mostly talked about others behind their backs. Spoke of things like, that member of staff is only strict or unfair or malicious towards this person, and so on. Just repeat those topics forever until someone couldn't keep themselves awake anymore. We even discussed how we could get back at the staff, and we took revenge on all of them in our imagination. 
Some kids even started to cry when talking about it, difficult as it was for us. The other subjects we spoke of were negative, talking about them was the only way to vent our frustration. Even though we felt despair about tomorrow, we were able to fall asleep. But sometimes a different subject popped up. It was about the Oringauk House of Love and Mercy on the other side of the river. Yeah, over there here they uh, get naughty nap time and snack time too. Because their president is a very nice person. House of Love and Mercy was a privately run orphanage just like the one I was at. I mean, what are the odds of that? <laughs> it's like, you know, like the whole grass is green on the outside, literally. It's like, that orphanage is the shit in a good way. This one is the shit in a very bad way. <laughs> And they're just like right next to each other, more or less. But it was a very kind facility, unlike ours. It seemed like a fancy land compared to our current environment. Two years before, when this place was a lot worse, a few children tried to escape. It was hard to believe there was a time when this orphanage was even worse to live at. Supposedly, three or four people tried to escape. I don't know the exact number, though. They headed to the House of Love and Mercy. Their escape was a success. Except for one unlucky child, they were able to get to the property of the House of Love and Mercy. I guess the staff couldn't follow them into the other orphanage's property. In other words, the other facility's property had to be out of their jurisdiction. But what if they turned them back to the other orphanage? That would, that would be heartbreaking. Staff was frustrated that kids got away from them. And they dragged the one they caught one they caught back here. I'm sure they wanted to bring back the others who got away from them too. I'm certain the staff were determined not to let a single one escape. It was easy to see that determination in the obstinate way that he locked the place up after that event. But they were never able to bring back the ones that got away. No matter how much the staff were mortified, they couldn't reclaim the children and punish them. In other words, if you could make it to the House of Love and Mercy, then you could escape the evil clutches of this hell. So you'd have to be very quick on your feet. On the other hand, the one they caught went through such misery afterwards. Yet the exact details of how he was punished were never passed down. All that remained were ominous phrases left by those who knew him at the time. The drowned ducky. The mashed caterpillar. The splayed piggy. I can't even imagine what kind of punishments they were. Well, the drowned ducky. Hmm. I mean, they obviously must have shoved his head under water for an extended period of time. And a mashed caterpillar. Slid. Yeah, you know what? I don't even want to think about what those could be. The only thing I can say is that those punishments were supposed to be far more harsh than the casket punishment, which was the most cruel punishment I knew of at the time. I can only imagine how horrible those punishments were from their ominous names. After that, the capture kid's wish came true, and he was able to leave the orphanage. Was he able to leave this orphanage safely and enjoy his freedom while breathing in fresh air under the blue sky? Well, according to the rumors, that wasn't what happened at all. While he was playing in the boiler room, he slipped and fell, injured his brain and died. The children were instructed not to go into the boiler room after that instant. Yeah, I'm sure he slipped. Everyone knew the boiler room was always locked. So everyone knew he was killed. And not just that, he was killed after being tortured. He was killed to teach the other children that they would face hell on earth if they tried to escape. Yet those who faced that risk and made it out, obtained ordinary average lives full of love and mercy's namesake, which were far better conditions than we lived in here. You know, couldn't they do something about it at the very least, you know, tell the other people at the orphanage what kind of shit goes on there and freaking get it investigated and you know, get those people shut down, but then they'd probably make it worse. 
I don't know. It's just like, it's just fucked up. In the house of love and mercy was really heaven. Maybe all the orphanages are pretty much the same. I mean, you never know, the other orphanage could be a shithole as well. But compared to my orphanage, I bet everything else would have been better. Even if someone escaped successfully, the police would catch him. Then he'd be sent back to the orphanage. Which would be pretty much the same as being killed. However, if he could reach the house of love and mercy, they'd take him in. They wouldn't send him back. But talking about escaping to the house of love and mercy, we were trying to forget how cruel reality was to us. Then one day, the leader of our group, Rico, said to us quietly, Would you try to escape if you had a chance to? Who didn't want to escape from here? It was a raw foolish question, but that wasn't what she meant. There's a chance to escape, would you take that chance? Only you had to go through if you got caught. That's what she meant. Not one of us could answer immediately. If the previous escape incident was a total success, then we might have fought differently. After that, both nature tied up security to prevent runaways. All the doors and windows were locked heavily and it wouldn't be at all easy to get out. Even if another group escape was planned, the success rate would be very low. Three escaped and one was caught before. Maybe two would be caught next time. No, maybe everyone would be. You know, this kind of shit just makes me think, it would be awesome if they could have like a Matilda kind of thing, you know? Like the ending of Matilda where Trunchbull like gets freaking... Like, you know, if you've seen Matilda, I'm not sure if the book pretty much follows the exact same thing. The book came first, obviously, I haven't read the book. But, you know, if you've seen the film, at least, it's like, you know, a scene like that where all the staff gets that, and, you know, only the good staff members, like, if there are any, you know, end up running the place instead. But no. If I could, I'd want to escape. That's the Eleven Mercy so far away. The bridge is long, too. We'll be caught before we get there. Besides, we can't even go outside. Everything's locked up. Now, if only if... You know what? Well, it's a shitty orphanage. They probably don't have bikes or anything. Like, if they could get a hold of some bikes, that could probably aid them in getting through. Although, it would immediately draw attention to themselves, but... Well, what can they really do? There are locks all over the orphanage. To escape, you'd need a key for both the inside and the outside, and after the lights were turned off, even each section of the hallways was individually locked. Make no mistake, this was a prison. According to the rumors, orphanages receive government funding depending on the number of children they house. So it's pretty much exactly like a prison. So if anyone escapes, they lose money. Also, if we were to expose the conditions at the orphanage, they would end up being inspected and things would get complicated for them. That was why we were so intent on keeping us, why they were so intent on keeping us locked up. I mean, I, I imagine it's one of those orphanages where it's like, you know, someone shows, if someone were to show up to, you know, uh, adopt one of the orphans, they'd be like, no. None of the orphans are never to be accepted into kind family homes, or any family homes for that matter. Piss off. Be like that bitch from Skyrim. Sure, if there was a chance I would want to escape. Realistically, there's no way we could. Every door is locked. Well, did you know? The hen house in the courtyard uses the same key as the door to the back stairs. Eh? Really? Shh. Iriku shushed us. Sometimes mass-produced locks take the same key. Of course, most places use different types of locks so that this won't happen. The staff in the orphanage must have overlooked it. So there were two locks that used the same key at the orphanage. However, most of us never had a chance to even touch the keys. But there were a few exceptions. One of those was the hen house. Each room group took turns taking care of different chores. If your group was assigned to clean the hen house, you'd have to get the key to it from the teacher's office. You were supposed to return the key immediately after you were done. But while taking care of the hen house, the key was in the children's hands. While the staff could occasionally come around to check, they couldn't keep an eye on us forever. Rick Chan, 
You aren't thinking about using that key, are you? Uh, that's not, it's too dangerous. Of course it's dangerous if there's only one of us. But it's different if we're in a group. Wait, why? Do you know why only one kid was caught in the last time they tried to escape? They were desperate. And so to escape as a group, they did something to increase the chance of success. That was why only one of them was caught. What did they do? They scattered as they ran. They dashed in different directions. They waited until the day when there were only a few people working at the orphanage and ran this way and that. And so, although it all depended on luck, it would increase the chance of success for sure. On your own, you'd probably have no hope, but if the staff were to chase after other children, then your own, own chance of escaping successfully would increase. In other words, Erika was inviting us to escape with her. The more children joined, the more each of our chances would increase. But among us, there were children who tattled to the staff for their own benefits. So she had to be very careful about who she talked to. Erika must trust us a lot. Erika, me... Tomomi and Kikuko. Get Kikuko. Four children. Do any of you want to stay here a day longer? The three of us shook our heads. But at the same time, we couldn't agree to escape with her either. Of course, we don't want to stay here a day longer, or even an hour longer. If we did exactly the same thing as we did yesterday, we might get yelled at tomorrow. I can't stand this anymore. I can't stand living in fear of what to do and what not to do so I won't be yelled at. We all feel the same way. We could endure strict rules, but it was almost impossible to endure vague ones. It wasn't too much of a stretch to say that the rules depended on the mood of the staff. This is okay. That isn't okay. Such borderline rules change daily. If we were to say anything about that, we would be treated horribly for it. I will escape, even if I have to do it alone. Like I said, the more people I join, the better our chance. Think about it. If they find out about this henhouse key trick, they're sure to change the lock on the back door. In other words, we only have one chance. Soon we regret not joining in later, it'll be too late. But... I'm scared. I'm scared too. If we get caught, we'll be killed. Tomomi and Kukuko weren't the only ones who felt afraid. Fear was perfectly understandable. Because all of a sudden, the fear of the punishment that would follow had become very realistic. I'm sure Eureka felt the same way too. But her courage was suppressing her fear. And because of that, she shared her idea with us. So do you plan to stay here forever? No, 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 no way! I know you're scared, but this is the only chance we have. You have to be brave just this once. What about you, Miyoko? Or do you want to go with me? I like to mommy and cook, uh, K Kikuko. That's a hell of a name to pronounce. But, like, blah, blah, blah. Kikuko. That's probably not even pronounced, or maybe the ooh is silent. I don't know. I wasn't trembling that much. Of course, I was scared in my own way, but compared to the other two, I must have appeared rather calm. Can we really escape? Of course, Eriko couldn't guarantee our success, but I had to ask her anyway. It's no guarantee. If you join me, I'll have a better chance of his keeping than trying to run on my own. Of course, the same goes for you, too. Rico gave a calculated reason, but I'm sure she just wanted a friend to agree with her. That was probably more important to her than increasing our chances to escape. Tomomi, Kikuko, if you're too scared, then I won't force you. Yoko and I will escape ourselves. Two is enough. Oh, well. Rico rushed the two to make up their minds. I almost looked cold, but that was her way of mustering their courage. Because it was very possible that, regardless of the outcome of our escape attempt, as our roommates, those two would be held responsible. It's not like we'll do it tomorrow. Our turn to take care of the henhouse is in a week. We'll wait for the perfect time to do it. If we don't feel that it's safe, then we'll wait until our next return. We're very careful. The rotation of staff and the time were important, but we also each had to know the way to the house of love and mercy. We were planning to split it, so we had to know the area. I made up my mind. Okay, I'm coming with you, but let's time our escape very carefully, okay? Of course, we'll be killed if we get caught. I don't want to die. I'll come too. Me too, me too. Tomomi and Kukuko agreed, and so we all decided to escape as a group. 
We waited for the perfect opportunity. We waited for the day where only a few staff members were at the orphanage. And we decided to let God take care of the rest. It's getting pretty intense, isn't it? Ah, it's open! Maybe it was the way I did it. Rika tried to open the lock several times without success, but I got it open on the first attempt. The back door opened slowly, and we felt a cool breeze. This wasn't the world of freedom just yet. In fact, it was the exact opposite. The staff were to find out we were here, we would be in big trouble. It was a world of danger. Unless we went through that dangerous world, we wouldn't be able to go any further. Okay, let's go. I think Rico wanted to say that. We are planning to leave with that as our key. But what we heard instead wasn't Rico's voice. What are you kids doing there? We started to run. It was raining. We all got soaked immediately and our clothes stuck to our skin. While that would normally be very uncomfortable, we couldn't even stop to think about that. We could only keep running in the rain. We were dashing on gravel, but it felt more like trudging through a muddy rice field. My feet kept sinking and I couldn't pull them up. I was frustrated because no matter how fast I tried to run, I wasn't gaining any speed. I felt a sense of urgency. I heard someone yelling, escape behind me, and all I could do was run like crazy. Okay, everyone go in different directions. Scatter! Come on, scatter! The Rico's crew, we all went different ways. Hoping they wouldn't be coming after us. Would we be able to reunite safely at the house of love and mercy? All four of us were together, or maybe someone would be missing. Or maybe everyone else would make it, and I'd be the one who gets caught. My thoughts were interrupted by the voice of a staff member coming from behind me. Hold it, wait, hold it right there! Staff members should have numbered fewer than us. So if I was lucky, they wouldn't be coming after me. Praying that the staff voices I heard in the distance weren't after me, I looked back for a moment. If I had time to turn around, why didn't I take an all step forward? Why didn't I try to escape further? As I turned around, I felt a huge hand cover my face. Its pinky fingers slipped into my open mouth. The hand grabbed my face, shoved me into the muddy gravel. Of course, I didn't stay quiet. I fought back. And then I saw his face. It was the scariest face I'd ever seen. So scary that he doesn't appear on screen because who gives a fuck about some nameless character in one scene? I realized it immediately. The only one to the captain me alive to use me as an example. And considering what would happen to me afterwards, killing here on the spot wouldn't pose any problem, would it? Yes, he looked at me with unworldly hate ready to end my life here and now. His pinky figure ended up touching my tongue. The indescribably nasty taste sent an icky feeling from my whole body. Ah, that's it. This is what my murder tastes like. He was going to shove that finger down my windpipe and suffocate me. And so in order to live, I fought back in the only way I could. Bite down on that motherfucker! <laughs> Something warm filled my mouth. I like swallowing blood after a nosebleed. I spit it from my mouth and ran out turning around, leaving behind the staff member clutching his pink finger. Kick him in the balls for good measure. You little shit, damn you, I'll kill you! I heard his roars echoing behind me. It wasn't a man that was after me, it was a beast. He had no interest in capturing me. His only goal was to see me dead. My shoes had slipped off. They weren't sneakers, so they came off easily while I was running like mad. My bare feet struck the gravel over and over. Ah, that's gonna hurt. But I guess that's the least of the worries right now. It was painful, but I didn't care. Because if I stopped, I knew what would happen to me. Three branches cut my face and barbed wire scratched my thighs. Ow! My feet and toes were bloody from running on gravel. The blood from the staff member's pinky finger dripped from down from my mouth, straining my chin and chest. I was running for my life with scratches and cuts all over my body. If I were to get caught, I would be killed. My pursuer had any sense, and I would be killed after being tortured. But if he didn't, I wouldn't be killed on the spot. I would be any. I don't want to be killed. I don't want to be killed. My lungs and heart were about to explode. My mind was blank from fear and lack of oxygen. I was about to lose consciousness. I might have given in. But I didn't hear the voice of a staff member coming after me. My knees were shaking. My legs couldn't move properly. I felt like I was going to fall like a puppet without screams. 
until I couldn't fall. I couldn't fall just yet. Ah, it was too late. My face had hit the gravel. I felt the awful sensation of falling, and immediately after the roar of the beast coming from behind me. Jam you my finger, my finger! Ah! <laughs> I must have hit my fire against the steering wheel when I jumped. I can feel the throbbing brain delayed slightly and sweating all over. I wiped the sweat on my forehead and put my hand on my chest, only then realizing how fast my heart was beating. I rubbed my thigh. I rubbed it in a straight line. That's not where I hit the steering wheel, but I feel like this is where it hurts. I can't see a scary beast in the moonlit car. I have my shoes on and I'm not covered in blood. My toes are fine too. Someone knocked on the window, startling me. Ah, Major, it's time. Ah, oh, thank you. I wanted to take a nap, so I told him to come wake me up in an hour. Maybe an hour was too long. Too long a nap actually makes you tired. I put my seat back up and got out of the car. The cool breeze feels good on my skin. I only see the moon. There's nothing else to see on this mountain trail. I car and a command vehicle disguised as a trailer are parked on the side of the street. I can still feel that bad taste in my mouth. I spat it out of the side of the street. On the right side, I mean. But even that couldn't get rid of it. This is the blood, saliva, and rain. Sweat from my forehead and raindrops got into my mouth, but I couldn't swallow, so I ended up drooling. That sensation around my lips brought back memories, and I tried to wipe my mouth. Maybe I'm nervous. That's why I had such a bad dream. I think there's a coffee machine in the command vehicle. An unpleasant cup of coffee will wake me up. So, has anything happened yet? No, not yet. We just got you for schedule check-in. Everything's okay over there. I see. Hey, could someone make me a cup of coffee? Now, does this seem familiar? I mean... It's freaking Tarkano. I mean, it's freaking obviously Tarkano this whole time. That's what I meant, like, at the end of the previous Science Rock. He's like, Yo, let's get revenge on Tarkano, you son of a bitch. And then we get this backstory on her, and it's like, Sympathy. Show some sympathy for this character. Look at all this hard thing she dealt with. It's like, yeah, it's tragic. But what she did was just unforgivable. Oh, but I remember this exact line. It was after a certain point in the arc. Sure, cream and sugar. Just cream, please. Uh, no, please put in some sugar, too. I still have a bad taste in my mouth. Feeling of biting and crushing again his little finger and his filthy blood filling my mouth. I'm sure a sweeter cup of coffee will wash down that bad taste and also wake me up from my nightmare completely. But not the nightmare that you went on to create? Even unlock the house of love and mercy. View new tips of Dibby and Ganny. Nope. I'll continue on a little bit.